there's that I guess network that neural network that thinks if I show any weakness I'm, I'm less of a man for me and my advocacy of, of mental health I'm saying that you know to show weakness is to show strength that was the voice of Saluki football's punter Jack Cahoon one of several eloquent and thoughtful responses that he has on the subject of mental health uh, we'll get into his own experience with that topic a little bit throughout this conversation but also last week was Mental Health Awareness Week, and Jack has put together a few initiatives, including bringing in some speakers to address the Saluki student-athletes, and he's doing a really good job of uh, putting some of his own experience into action to help others around him. We'll also talk about punting. He, he did really well in his first year as a Saluki last year. An all-newcomer pick in the conference also had an 80-yard punt at South Dakota State, which was the longest of any Missouri Valley Football Conference punter last season. Uh, and, oh yeah, he's, he's from Australia. He's got a really fun story on how he got to the United States and to Carbondale specifically. We'll get into travel, accents, Aussie football, the Gold Coast, all that fun stuff throughout this as well. Enjoy it. Here's Jack Cahoon. It's a, it's an evergreen question this day, but you know how are you holding up through everything that's going on? It's um, firstly appreciate you having me having me on, Connor. Um, but yeah, it's been I guess a bit of a roller coaster, especially these past couple of months. Um, obviously, talking to you now during another quarantine for me. This is uh, number five for me this year, so bringing on ten weeks once I once I get out. Um, but yeah, it's been I guess pretty undulating for me given that I, I did go back to Australia in March and um, was, was, was lucky to be able to spend some time at home with the family um, and, and see them, which was rich, which was really nice. But then again, I didn't know if I was going to be able to come back um, to Carbondale and, and play football. Obviously that was still a big hypothetical um, about me coming back in the, the current landscape that we're all in now. Um, but no, here I am now, I guess, in quarantine, but happy to be back here and, and to be able to see that football is on the horizon with us playing in a couple of weeks and then to still have the season move to the spring. I guess it's, it's going from strength to strength for us, especially, you know, as we'll probably delve into a little bit later for our mental health as well, being football athletes, uh, I guess having the assurance that there is football for us is, is something that we can all benefit from. And, and for me right now, it's you know, getting over this hill and, and being able to look forward to the game that's coming up soon. When did you eventually get back to the States? So I flew home in March just after spring break and I came back here uh, to Carbondale. I think it was halfway through July. So usually before um, spring, uh, before fall, fall camp, sorry. Um, and it was, I guess I was pretty lucky to come back when I did because to get out of Australia right now, you have to apply to the government to, to leave on, on special grounds. And I was fortunate enough to be um, awarded the grounds to be able to leave the country. Um, but yeah, I was staring down the barrel of not knowing when I was going to come back at all. So to, to, become, to come back just before fall camp worked out quite well. Obviously, um, we didn't really know what we were walking into, but to be back when I was, I was pretty happy with. And you know, to be able to settle back into everything back here has been really good. So you mentioned five quarantines. Did you have to quarantine on the front end and the back end of your trip to and from Australia to the United States? Yeah. So when I flew back to Australia, we had to do um, two weeks of solitary quarantine, quarantine. So I was by myself for two weeks at home. We just sectioned off a, a part of the house for me to be able to uh, obviously live in for the two weeks. And then when I came back to um, when I came back to Carbondale as well, I had to do another two weeks. It ended up being a little bit longer because of the testing process. It took a, a, a little bit longer to get back. Um, and then I had, yeah, been contact traced back to two cases on the team. So unfortunately for me, it was a, you know, a two week hiatus from, from practice and whatnot. Um, and then now, now we're here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, we were going to get into this a little bit later, but uh, I'm just curious with everything that you've been through the past seven months, um, you know, where was your psyche? Where was your mental health at when you weren't sure you could come back and finish out your senior year playing college football? It was, yeah, it was, it was something that obviously I, I took a, a lot more seriously because of, I guess, the nature of, of the situation and, 
and really I had no idea and, and everyone involved had no idea of, of what the future had for not only myself, but for, for the program, uh, for at- athletics in general. So it was, it was a lot of to and fro for me, not, not knowing when I was going to be able to come back to Carbondale. And now it's more or less of not knowing when I'm going to be able to return to Australia um, because essentially the borders have, have shut internationally for, for Australians overseas. Um, so that's another, I guess, thing in, it, in itself. But yeah, I, I became more consciously aware of how I was mentally because, you know, spending more time by yourself and in, in quarantine and, and what have you, you really do have a lot of time to think. And and for me, it was, you know, it was positive thoughts. I think that was what got me through was, was a lot of positive affirmation and, and looking forward instead of being stuck in whatever situation you're in at that point in time. So I think having a positive outlook on everything on my end made made everything a lot easier and really affirming to myself that, you know, things were going to work out. And, you know, if they weren't, I was going to see what, what avenues I could take to make sure that they were going to work out positively for not only myself, but everyone involved, whether that's family, friends, um, you know, and coaches and, and the program here as well. What about quarantining in the atmosphere of a college university? I mean, you've got so many things that could potentially distract you. It's a naturally social environment, but there have been times where you have to be alone for two weeks. How do you get through those times? Yeah, it's, it's especially hard, um, especially given the team that we have. We have such a, a close bond um, with all, all the boys and, and the coaches as well. We're, we're a really united team, which is you know, an amazing um, thing to be a part of, to be a part of a team where we're all such close, close mates, close brothers. And uh, it's hard, um, especially being here with just, um, I'm, I live with, with Colton Geralds and other guy on the team so it's it's just us and it, and it does get quiet but I guess when you kind of benefit that everyone lives in the same area we all live in the same apartment complex so we get guys that you know walk past and we can have those conversations out in the balcony for 15 20 minutes and you know the power of the internet being able to FaceTime um, family and friends you know moments notice and um, I guess mom's probably not too happy about it but the uh, the benefits of, of a PlayStation of Call of Duty being able to just flick it on and, and play with your mates, you know, any time of the day for me, it's, it's been instrumental in, I guess, holding my own in the, in the past couple of weeks and, and quarantines alike, because just to be able to reach out to, to guys in, in whatever format that may be with family as well. Um, it's been huge, but yeah, living in a, in a college town, especially, yeah, again, with the, with the close team that we have, it, it is a bit hard sometimes there is uh, distractions there, but you know, I'm fortunate. I guess it's a blessing and a curse. My course is quite demanding, so I'm, I'm, I've always got something to do, or some study to do, or some lectures to read over. So that that keeps me on my toes as well. Yeah. Economics, some research, and uh, a, a thesis coming up. That's that's plenty to keep your mind occupied, right? Yeah, it's uh, it's full on. It's it never takes its foot off off the gas pedal. So. I'm always, yeah, if I'm not on the field, I'm, I'm in the weight room. If I'm not there, I'm uh, busy at home studying at, at, on my desk. What reservations did your family have not knowing when you could come back now that you have gone back to Carbondale? Um, I guess it was, it was something that we we're all aware of. Um, and I, I'm just really, I guess, happy and um, in everything that I'm doing. And, and they could see that, that, that I was happy in, in what I was doing and and being a part of something over here is something that I have a lot of joy in. Um, and they could, they could feel that and they didn't want to hold me back from, you know, doing the things that I wanted to do, whether that's, you know, pursuing my, my master's degree at the moment. Um, and then also playing division one college football is something that I had held myself in, in high regard for. And, and they could see that and they didn't want to stop me from, from all those things. So I'm, you know, credit to them for them letting me go. Because yeah, there was there was huge uncertainty with what we were walking into, um, and now I guess the waters do become a bit bit more clearer about what my future holds and and what my family's future holds as well. Obviously, being in Melbourne right now, they've been in a strict lockdown since March, and it hasn't lifted. Um, they've just been been placed with curfews and, and and things like that as well. So for them, you know, I'm trying to be a, a support network for them because I do have you know. We may, it may not seem that way, but I have so much more freedom and we have so much more freedom than, than what they do. So I'm just trying to, you know, keep their spirits high. Um, 
but them them letting me i guess come back here to carbondale was something that i could really benefit from because they could see what i was doing here and the great things that are happening in, in carbondale and, and didn't want to hold me back from from that personally and um in the future as well was it this time that got you interested in being kind of a mental health advocate or, or was there something else uh, previous to the time of COVID-19 that, that made you want to be an advocate uh, publicly on social media, within the athletic department, with your teammates, et cetera? It's, it's something that I've always thought about um, and always, I guess, looked internally as well. I've always been, you know, consciously aware of how my mental health is and, um, you know, within my own rights, I practice, I, I, I meditate every day. Uh, I journal, I do a lot of these things that I guess are um, not normalized yet. And I thought to myself about how profound um, these uh, putting these things into my daily life have been for myself. And, and I could only think about how many, how many others could benefit from the practices that, that I'm doing. Um, and I guess obviously with, with the situation that's going on right now, this environment presents so much negativity for everyone. And I thought, what better chance to be able to advocate something that has been pushed to the side for quite a long time. Um, I feel like it's been neglected, male mental health especially. Um, and I thought, you know, there's no better time to bring this to light and really create some focus around it. Um, so in creating, I guess, our uh, inaugural mental health week, which was last week, and then my mental health group for men that I've created called Sit With Us, for me, it was just putting a spotlight onto something that really deserved the, the limelight because of the current situation. But I think just historically speaking, especially in the realm of men's mental health, it's something that gets pushed to the side quite a lot. And having that there now is, is something that I believe everyone can benefit from. So that was my main um, focus in, in, in creating all of this. I was just about to ask you about mental health being, being a man. Um, and especially in the arena of sport where a lot of times it's, it's about preaching toughness, not showing emotion, all those sort of things. Uh, what kind of reception have you gotten to some of the initiatives that you've started and conversations you've had? It's, it's been something that's, that's been quite well received, which I'm very thankful for. Um, again, as you said, in the realm of, of college sports and to be an athlete and to be a man as an athlete as well, I think those feelings of weakness or those feelings of vulnerability get pushed to the side because there's that, I guess, network, that neural network that thinks if I show any weakness, I'm, I'm less of a man. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not the man that, that everyone thinks I am. And for me and my advocacy of, of mental health, I'm saying that, you know, to show weakness is to show strength. And that's my message that I'm trying to put out there is, you know, having that, emotional vulnerability or, or going to someone like, Hey, I'm, I'm not feeling okay. I'm not feeling all right. They shouldn't, you know, be scared about feeling those t that type of way, or they shouldn't um, have an expectation of something's negative is going to happen from being true to yourself and being true to the people around you. Um, so for me, I guess you, getting that message out there that to show weakness is to show strength and, you know, to delve deeply into how you are as an individual and, and, and how you're, on a level on, a, on an emotional level, how you're operating. And I think that through this, it only leads to more profound impacts positively within your own self, but with the team in general, if I walk out on the field and I know my teammate, you know, he's put it all out there and, and we're working together to, to create tighter bonds and, and to be more mentally aware of how we're all feeling. I think, you know, that's going to be huge in, in team success. I know there have been, several professional athletes that have been more open about this conversation the last several years. Kevin Love comes to mind in the NBA. Um, several athletes have written about it in the Players' Tribune. Um, was there an athlete that you looked to that had the strength to talk about this that kind of inspired you to, to go a little bit more public about it? For me, it was when I read Kevin Love's article um, and I saw how – close he was and and the brink of you know his demise almost was it was so close and the impact that we saw through him being able to level with himself and be i'm not okay and, and reaching out to people 
and how he said that reaching out to people had the most profound effect on his mental health. And I think that there's so many people that are struggling and there are so many people that are too scared to um, share these stories out of fear of, of rejection, out of fear of, you know, being looked at differently. And I think that through these, and you, Dak Prescott as well, through these instances of athletes really, you know, putting it all out there and how profound it, it ha- that impact has had on themselves and their future. Their future has been a lot brighter. Their future has been more successful because they're able to truly accept how they're feeling and, and reach out to people and ask for help. And I think that, yeah, Kevin Love's story really spoke to me because of the caliber player that he, he is and he has been for such a long time. But, you know, when you, it's, it's the common, I guess, story of hiding behind that veil of, of being an athlete, that mask that we wear, you know, we put a pair of pads on, on a, on a Saturday afternoon, Saturday night, and we can, we can hide from, from how we're truly feeling and we take, take it off and, and we're back battling with our, our internal demons. So to be able to bring these conversations to light in my eyes is only going to impact, you know, these men in, in such a positive way. For, um, for, for a non-athlete like myself, or maybe some of the people listening that, that haven't been in that field or put the pads on or the jersey on that you're, you're talking about, just, just give people an idea maybe what some of the, the main, I guess, risk factors are that could jeopardize mental health as an athlete. I think the biggest thing is the power of social media right now and, and being an athlete. You, you can't hide from anything. There's, there's no action that goes unseen. There is um, nothing really that, that we can hide from anymore. And I think that's a huge thing, especially for, for high caliber players, constantly being in the spotlight and, and the ability for them to be so easily ridiculed online is, is something that contributes to, I think, a lot of athlete mental health. Um, it's something that we're always consciously aware of um, even like myself having a, a bad game, whether I, um, there was one week last year where I, um, I dropped the ball and for me, I was, I was, I felt bad. I felt bad for my team because I'd let them down, but I, I was scared on, I was scared to go on social media after that game because of, you know, the, the, the backlash that it might've caused and, um, and not only for myself, but for my coaches, possibly them being ridiculed for bringing me out here when, uh, they could say that I'm just a waste of space being out there, you know, not knowing anything about the game, being so foreign to the whole um, American football scene. So that's, I guess, one of the things. But again, being an athlete is we're you know we're a student athlete as well, and the a lot of every everyone will sell it, tell you in the in the athletics department you're you're a student before you're an athlete, and we have the same academic demands as, as any kid on campus. But then we also have those 20 hour plus training weeks. So there's that burden that comes from being a, being a student as well. And, you know, bad grades can, can cause anything with, with students. So we have to deal with that as well. So, you know, you could have the, the possibility of dealing with dropping a touchdown to win the game and then getting a D in a test and being close to failing a class. So there's a whole, um, I guess, amalgamation of, of things that can come together so quickly for athletes and um, for me in creating these programs is how can we better deal with these things that are happening in our lives and how can we become aware of them earlier so we can stop these things from getting worse but also how can we help others in the same situations that we may be in as well. So going back to your example of, of dropping a snap and kind of the fear of retribution online, are, are you thinking that immediately after the play? Uh, in the moment, it's it's more or less of I've you know I've let down my team. Uh, I I think of myself as uh, another player on the defensive side, so I've just let all my defensive teammates down because they got to go out in the field and and try and recuperate my loss um, and, and stop what may be a touchdown, what may be um, a, a long drive from from the opposition's offense. So initially, that they're my thoughts. Um, I always want to do the best for, for my team, obviously, every time I walk out on the field. And um, I guess to deal with that internally is something that I take to heart because I, I pride myself on, you know, being one of the best punters in, in the country. And, and that's something that I, I'm aspiring to be this year and, and in, the, in the years to come as well. So 
initially it's 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 and it's always been about the team for me it's um, I, I hold my head high in, in respect of doing the right things constantly. And when things don't go my way, it's I only feel um, guilt towards my other teammates. One more for you on this topic. So we talked a little bit about Kevin Love. He's he's a great example of you know somebody who's who's dealt with his mental health. He's dealt with it publicly. He's been vulnerable about vulnerable about it. But he's also competed at a really high level, winning an NBA championship when you communicate to your fellow athletes, where do you think the balance is between being honest with your emotions and your mental health, but also being able to compete at, at a high level and um, kind of have that veil of toughness and um, competitiveness that we were talking about before. I guess the, the most important thing is, is those environments. And when we're talking about mental health um, it's, those environments where we bring up those conversations, I think is, is really important. Um, you know, obviously having four mates over or being in the, being in a practice together and there's four of you guys there, those instances aren't the best to bring up those types of conversations. And, um, for me, it's, yeah, it's very much on, on the environment side of things and, and where to bring up those conversations surrounding mental health, um, and those conversations of vulnerability, Um, and that's where, you know, again, the power of, of, of of our phones, the social media is, um, finding those times where we can, um, create those environments where we, that can lead to positive conversations surrounding mental health. Um, but then again, when you talk about hiding behind, not hiding behind, but, um, the veil of, of being an athlete as well, obviously there is a toughness that comes to it, no doubt. And we do have to, um, show a brave face when we walk out on the field. But there, there is a time to be vulnerable as well. There is a time to be um, fully accepting, accepting of, of your emotions and, and how you're feeling. But then that's where the environment comes in and, and setting yourself up in those positive environments and safe environments as well where you can bring up those topics surrounding mental health. Thanks for your insight on this. This is, um, you know, I, I feel like it's something that's, that's talked about, written about. You know, there's, there's stuff out there about it, but I think to... To hear it from somebody within is, uh, is, is really valuable. So thanks for what you've done with your initiatives and, and speaking about it here too. I appreciate it. And I think it, it's the, the first way and the first step in this process of creating these positive conversations and, and creating more ed- education surrounding the realm of, of mental health is, you know, you've you got to step out there for, you, for yourself and put it out there and say, this is, this is my situation and, and this is what I've been through. Um, and this is how and wh- where I want to make change. Um, for me, I guess dealing with, you know, mental, I think it's something that we all go through within a, a, during a phase of our life or something that can, I guess, slowly creep up behind us. And, and for me, I guess the, the life I've, I've led, um, and the pl- places that I've lived have, have brought about, um, instances of, you know, mental, um, I guess, you know, where my mental wellness has been questioned, where it's been doubted, um, having moved out of home straight out of, um, straight out of high school at 18, I packed up and, and, and left and, and started a new life really, um, in coastal Australia. And then once I graduated there, moving straight over here to the U S I'm a time zone away from my family. Um, I struggle sometimes and, uh, that's something that that I ha- I'm working with um, and creating positive networks in my life here in, in the United States, um, and I feel like there's it's my time to share my story and and see look if if we can implement these practices into our lives, have these positive conversations, educate ourselves on on mental health and, and mental wellness, how positively it can impact our lives. For me, looking at myself now and and where I am as as an individual. Um, and then looking at myself five, four years ago when I just finished high school, obviously it comes with development, but I, I could say I, I'm a mere shell of a man uh, that, I, that I once was. And, and the development that I've seen in my life has, has come from implementing these positive techniques of, of meditation, of journaling, and everything else that's come along the way for me is, is something that I've recognized now internally uh, and emotionally as well. And for me, it's I want to share these stories I want to share these um, practices that you can employ and and yield positive effects on on your life as well. That's awesome.
That's great. That's really great. Uh, was there a culture shock when you came over here? Um, the, the hardest thing for me was obviously we drive on opposite sides of the road. Now that obviously directly translates to how you walk on a footpath as well on the sidewalk. So a lot of the time initially I was, I felt like I was walking in the way of a lot of people and I was like, why, why is this happening? And then obviously you look out to the road and see everyone's driving on the opposite side. And then that light bulb clicks and you're like, Oh, that, that might be the case. Why I keep walking into people. Um, but I guess outside of that, obviously people have a great deal um, of, I guess, respect for me coming out here, but some of them just can't understand me. I speak too quickly sometimes, um, having conversations with family back home when teammates may be in the same room and, and the speed of conversation that we have, they just can't keep up. Um, and then slight word differences where um, candy is, we call them lollies back home, um, biscuits for us, uh, a scones back in Australia. So there's a couple of different things, but more or less, it's been quite a smooth transition. I can hear your accent. Um, I'm sure most people in the U S can hear your accent, but when you go back home, uh, the, the family members start ribbing you like you're, uh, you've got a little bit of an American accent now. I think they like to toy me with, with that notion that I've started to develop a, a slight accent, but I think in some words, I can pick it up myself and I'm like, that doesn't sound too Australian anymore, but more or less, I think that I guess my Aussie roots will, will never leave me anymore. And I think that, um, yeah, I'd like to hope that I'll hold on to the accent, but I guess that'll come with time and, and I'll see what happens in the future with, with that. We'll see if uh, you, you go home with an American twang. Yeah, I, I get, especially in Southern Illinois as well. There's there's a bit of a twang down here, so I'll, I'll see if I if I pick it up or not in the next year or so. For sure, for sure. Um, should we talk some punting before we Absolutely. let you go? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I want to first ask you about your Aussie football background. Um, you know, it's it's not quite as uh, simple as you standing behind a long snapper and personal protectors and, and punting a ball away in Aussie football. So uh, what type of player were you? Were you a midfielder, a defender, a forward? Where were you playing on the Aussie football field? So I guess to, to paint a picture for everyone that, that might be listening, um, uh, Aussie rules is, is, I guess, chalk and cheese from, from what it is we think football is. Um, for myself personally, I was, I was a forward, so I played up, played up in the forward line and, and I would kick you know, I, my main goal was to kick goals. Um, so for me, that's where a lot of my kicking ability came from, um, especially long range kicking as well, um, being a, a high half forward. Um, but what came with that too was a lot of running. And it's something that I don't do much anymore, but um, playing up on the high forward line, I'd run probably close to eight miles a game. So I was used to, I guess, being in, out, around and under the ball all the time. And now it's, it's, yeah, again, it's chalk and cheese. I walk out there, I take basically two and a half steps and that's my kicking motion done. And, you know, I hope that it's, it's waved fair court and then I can walk off the field. So for me, my, my journey was, a, was obviously a bit different. And a lot of my um, mates that play college football here um, in the States too have had a very similar story. And, um, yeah, gr growing up playing Aussie rules, I picked a football up when I was five and, didn't put it down till I was till I was 21, and that was that was my life was was playing Aussie Rules, and obviously some uh, some things in my life happened. Uh, there was I guess it was and it was a real turning point in my life too. Um, I was finishing my undergraduate degree on the Gold Coast um, at Bond University, and I was out on a on a night out with mates, um, just enjoying the, the festivities of the night, and uh, walked out the front of a nightclub. And I was uh, what we call king hit from behind. So it was an unprovoked attack. I was uh, punched in the, in the head from, from behind um, and, and completely knocked out cold from there. And I guess I woke up in, in a hospital, in the hospital and, and didn't really know what was going on. And for me, that was a change in heart and a change in focus. Um, I put myself more towards my academic studies. And at the time, I had a full-time job too. Um, working in sales. So that was really, I guess, a turning point in my life. But then that's where um, it opened up punting for me and the realm of college football. And 
you know, it's something that, you know, it was the scariest moment of my life. I was, yeah, I, I didn't think that I was going to come out of, of that night really. Um, but then, you know, here I am being able to discover college football and, and still have the, um, I guess, still being able to kick and enjoy kicking in sport, but being able to still play a sport as well um, is a huge blessing for me. So punting saved my, I guess, sporting career and um, really spurred me on to, you know, reach the goals that I'm, I'm putting myself in front of right now. So after the attack, you wouldn't have been able to run the eight miles to, to play Aussie football. Is that what you're saying? So it was more or less, um, I guess, just the head trauma um, and the, the concussion itself. It really, for me, put um, life into a bit more perspective. And um, obviously, I, I tried to go through the avenues of playing professional football back home, um, but that unfortunately didn't eventuate for me. Um, and then I just, from there, really reshifted my focus into, into studying and, and finishing my degree. Um, and then ticking that box in life, I guess. And then I guess opening up whatever doors were there in front of me once school finished. And, and one of them happened to be continuing my um, academic career, which was something I always um, was striving for after finishing my um, undergraduate degree. And then, you know, being able to punt that came from it as well. Um, and the non-contact aspect uh, for me uh, was, was a big selling point. How long after the attack were you able to, start punting and working toward that goal? Um, I did take quite a long break. I took probably four or five months off, you know, playing sport in the realm of, of Aussie rules or anything like that. I, I obviously got, a, got into the gym a lot um, in the weight room and, and started running a lot as well too because that was a, was a great release for me outside of, of work and, and studying. Um, and then punting really came along in, I'd say, January of 2019. Um, when I started full time with Pro Kick Australia in in Melbourne with um, Nathan Chapman um, there and and John A Smith um, and I think from January I started punting full time and then uh, June I was recruited by by Coach Hill and Coach Coach P um, and then I was here in in July so it was a really quick turnaround for me in regards to picking up those fundamental skills and and learning the ins and outs of, of what it is to, to play football and, and at the collegiate level as well, rules and I guess the dynamic of the sport too because, again, it's completely different to what I was used to playing in the past. Not many people uh, play in their first college football game and have it be the first college football game they've ever been to. You have that unique distinction, don't you? It was, uh, yeah, and it's an experience and, and a memory that I'll, I'll never forget Um I can, I remember stepping out there for the first snap. I was on the, I think I was on the 36 going in and Dan snapped the ball to me and I closed my eyes as I caught it because I really had no idea what I was getting myself into. Um, But once I walked off the field, I walked off with a, you know, big smile on my face and I knew that this was the the right decision that I made to come here and and play football at SIU. And, um, you know, I, I just, couldn't wipe the smile off my face because I just knew internally that this was the the right decision that I made and and I couldn't be happier. You mentioned uh, the non-contact aspect of playing American football and being a punter. Um, I I think one of the the cooler parts of your position is you have something that's called a personal protector. Uh, Sometimes it's a couple of guys standing in front of you. Uh, I've just always thought that, I don't know, that that would feel kind of cool to almost say you have like security in front of you. Um, is, is that the case? Is, is it kind of cool to say, yeah, I've got, I've got people protecting me. I've got a personal protector. Yeah. Well, I guess I, I got two of the biggest guys out there on the field that protect me too in, in Jacob Garrett and Cole Stewart. So I'm in pretty safe hands. Um, Jacob and Nick Raby last year looked after me and they did, they did a damn good, well, a uh, damn good job of doing it. So um, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool seeing, seeing them out of the corner of your eye, thud a couple of guys that are trying to get to me and me, uh, being able to get the ball off, off pretty safely and comfortably. But, you know, I know now that if, if that comes, if, if the protection bleeds a little bit that I might have to take a hit or, or whatever it may be. And, and that's, it is what it is, as they say, but I'm, uh, I'm held in pretty good stead by those guys in front of me. They do a pretty amazing job. Yeah. It's, it's your own little secret service. That's it. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, well, hey, two weeks from tomorrow, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll hopefully get to do this thing for real. That's pretty exciting. It's, yeah, it's awesome to be able to, um, you know, we walked out of fall camp not knowing that we were going to play football. Um, we had no idea. And when Coach Hill um, surprised us with the fact that we're playing SEMO, I think you couldn't wipe the smile off the boys' faces. Um, it was a sense of relief that we can now work towards something. Um, and it gives us hope and, it's, and it gives us a great way to start the season as well. I think this will be a massive barometer on, on how our success goes, you know, leaving this year and, and going into camp at the start of next year and then into the spring season as well. So we all can't wait. Um, it should be a really good night, you know, playing on a, on a Friday night. We all dream of playing on Friday nights and night games is something I especially love. And um, at the possibility of, of having people in the crowd there, I know I've got a, a few people in my corner that are hopefully coming down to watch. So I'm excited for them to, to be there in the stands um, cheering me along and, and all of us as well. I think, you know, we can't wait and to bring that wheel back to, to Carbondale and, and put it on the mantelpiece for hopefully the next couple of years as well. So I'm looking forward to that too. <laughs> That's what Saluki fans like to hear. All about the wheel. Yeah, we uh, that, that, that wheel's coming home and it's going to spend a good time. It might get a couple of cobwebs in the years to come because that, that wheel's not leaving Carbondale for a good while now. <laughs> Oh, love it, man. Love it. Um, well, I'm going to let you go, but I appreciate your time and um, you're doing good work in the department with some of the mental health initiatives that we just talked about. And again, I really appreciate your honesty and in, in telling your story. I appreciate you having me on, Connor, to be able to yeah share my story and, and bring more light to the situation is something that I'm, I'm working towards as well. And, um, you know, creating more uh, awareness around the mental health space, especially being athletes, um, whether you're, you know, a male athlete, a, a female athlete, we all have ebbs and flows in uh, what it is with our mental health. And, you know, that goes for staff, goes for coaches and, and people listening as well. You know, our mental health is something that we're always, I guess, at, at a battle with. And sometimes we win and sometimes we lose. And to be able to better equip ourselves to deal with those situations when they might not go in our favor is um, one of my motivators and, and equipping everyone. Uh, with more tools to be able to positively impact not only their own mental health, um, but the mental health of others around them and to be able to bring um, people up to, to their level of, of positivity is, is something that I strive for and, and everything that I'm trying to do here with uh, mental health at SIU. Well said, my man. Thank you, Connor. I appreciate it. Can't wait to see you on the 30th. Thank you. Look forward to it. All right. That's Jack Gahoon, the SIU punter here on the Saluki Standards Podcast.